tower, still a strong tower. God help, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower.
Praise God. Turn with me to Job chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, then 10 through 16. Such an honor to be here. Thank you to your district superintendent, this whole board. Thank you, sir, for letting me come. And you called me and you said, Brother Jerry Jones is going to be the night evangelist. I thought to myself, well, what in the world are you at me coming? Yeah, didn't he do an incredible job last night? I said, if you're a preacher, not only did the message touch your heart, but you got a master class on preaching. Brother Jones, it's such an honor to be here with you. Thank you so very much. I want to give honor to my mom and dad. Uh, and uh, they're not here, uh, and, and they're back home in Canada, but anything good that's come from my life and my ministry, I owe it all to my mom and my dad that uh, they're first-generation Pentecostals. It's so neat. My, my son is second-generation. My father came into the life of alcohol and drug addiction, and uh, at, at 20 years old, got married, and... Uh, then my family moved and my dad started a church. There were two people in the city that we think they had the Holy Ghost. We weren't sure after a couple of years. And, and uh, my son is second generation Pentecostal. But on my wife's side, my, my incredible wife and son are in Thunder Bay, Ontario with her grandparents who are in their 90s. Those of you that are students of Pentecostal history, I, Brother Oscar Vogo was preaching revivals through uh, Western Canada, there they gave up a chunk of their family farm, or my my wife's grand uh, grandmother's parents gave a chunk of their family farm to build a one God Jesus name church. And so on one side we've got rescue from hell, on the other side we've got six generations of oneness apostolic, and so it's a great heritage that I stand on that I'm here here today, and I want to give honor to my wife and son and and her family. And, it's just so good to be here. We had a great session with licensed ministers, and some of you have requested uh, the notes. And, and so, Brother, uh, Brother Boyd would like me uh, to let you know that, that we will make those notes available to you. Uh, you just got to email the district office. Is that, is that correct, sir? Email the district office. And uh, we never got a chance to go through all that material, so we'll make that available for you. I've footnoted my sources, so if there was a quote that stands out to you, you can follow down the rabbit trail and find and find the source material. Let's look to the word of the Lord. Job chapter 9, 1 through 2, 10 through 16. I'm reading from the New King James. It says that Job answered and said, Truly, I know it is so. But how can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. He does great things past finding out, wonders without number. If he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? God will not withdraw his anger, the allies of the proud. That's not... Puffed up or arrogant, it means those who are strong and robust, they that lie prostrate beneath them. How then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. But if I called and he answered me, I wouldn't believe that he was listening to my voice. With the help of the Holy Ghost, I want to preach to you for a few moments on this subject. The void between God and me. The void between God and me. Lord, you're here with us today. We sense your presence. And I believe that you're about to pour out your spirit and touch our hearts, renew our faith, and renew our minds. I pray, Jesus, that you would be with us by your spirit today. Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. Job, at this point in our text, has suffered just about as much as anyone in the whole of Scripture. He's lost absolutely everything. His money is gone. He is in financial ruin. His businesses are is gone. His career and all that he had built has disappeared from him. His family is gone. It's all ripped suddenly and violently from him. We often focus on the last part of the book of Job where everything turns around. But have you ever stopped and thought what it would have been like to have been Job? Businesses, gone. 
through theft and natural disaster, take everything that he had built and annihilated it in a matter of moments. His servants are trampled and murdered, stabbed and beaten to death by marauding bandits, people he'd employed for years, tasked with feeding their families, with caring for their children. People that he had developed a long working relationship over the years are now dead. All of them are dead. And then finally, his children. The trauma of pulling torn and crushed bodies of his grown kids from the rubble of their collapsed home. In Job's day, there were no first responders. There were no you know, police officers or firefighters to put tape around the neighborhood and go, Mr. Job, I don't think you want to come in here. You don't need to see this. Let us take care of this for you. He would have been the first responder and being crushed is not a peaceful death. The trauma of their death is weighing heavy on them. It is a lifetime of trauma, a lifetime of tragedy compressed into a very short period of time. Now impoverished with nothing left, scraping infection from his boils. He sits in a pile of ashes. His head is spinning. What has happened to me? Is this real life? Where is God? And why won't he help me? As he sits in shock. And that shock gives way to this deep and abiding, dark sadness. His friends, who are the worst friends in the world, by the way, come over to see him. One by one, his friends make their way up the driveway of what is left of his home. And they see him. And he's in such a sad state, they burst into tears. I don't know about you, but if I'm in the hospital... Ravaged by infection. And everything has gone wrong in my life. And I call for my friends. And instead of showing up with a pizza, they show up and they burst into tears at how awful I look. And then they cry for three days. I'm sure there's some cultural bridge that I have not crossed about mourning and mourning culture. But I'm just saying, like, this is it's a rough way to say hello. And then after they dry their eyes because of how bad his life is, they then begin to accuse him of what he must have done to deserve such punishment. All of the ways in which he has failed God for God to bring the hammer of his justice and anger upon his life. That brings us to our text. Job is responding overwhelmed by their accusations. He says, I know it is so. Verse 1, but how can a man be righteous before God? If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Who can debate God, he says? Who can stand before God and make their case? You could not even speak in the enormity of his presence. You couldn't eat out a word to debate him and defend yourself one time out of a thousand. He does great things past finding out wonders without number. If he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. I don't know what God is doing. I don't know where God is and I don't know what he's trying to do in my life. If he takes away, who can stop him? Who can go to God and go, what are you doing with my life? What are you doing with my family? What are you doing with my kids? God will not withdraw his anger. Even the strong cannot stand in his presence. They eat the dirt. How then can I, who am neither strong nor perfect, who is broken and frail and full of trauma, even answer God? How can I even come up with the words to say, to reason with him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. And then here's the saddest part of the song. If I call, if I mustered up the courage, if I mustered up the strength to question God and somehow He calls back, I would not even believe that it was His voice. I would not believe that He was even listening to my voice. Job here is turning He's turning philosophical at this moment in the song. He's talking about divine incomprehensibility. How can a human being even know God? How can 
someone as frail and as small and as finite as me ever fully be able to comprehend the voice and the mind and the movement of God. Job is saying there is a void. There is a void between God and me. A vast, empty, dark space separates us. God is so large. The creator of the universe, his movements are imperceivable. If he were next to me right now, how would I even know? When God is mad, the strong fall into the dirt. Look at how I have been reduced to nothing so quickly. I am fragile. The void between who I am and my weakness and who he is in his greatness is an uncrossable emptiness that I can never, ever attempt to cross. And while God describes God's power as an omnipotent force that shakes the earth, darkens the stars, hides the sun, disappears the mountains. And in the process, God's boot, he says, is so big. That when he crushes the wicked, the blameless gets swept up in the collateral damage. So how can a God like this understand a man like me? See, Job's questions are not ones of cognition, but of empathy. I, I mean, I know God knows me. I know that he can find me. I know that he knows my address. But does he understand what it is like to be me? Everywhere he goes, the proud fall before him. Everywhere he goes, he brings judgment and destruction upon the wicked. God can't get tired. God can't get sick. God will never be crushed by life. God will never be beaten down by natural disasters. God is not, nor has ever been, weak. So how in the world can he identify with me? And if we're honest this morning, and I know it feels a little uncomfortable to hear me say these types of things, but if we can be real just for a little bit, Job's questions are our questions too. His plea is our plea too. No, you may not have lost your home in an earthquake. Maybe you've lost your mental health. You may not have pulled your family from the rubble of your physical home, but you've got loved ones trapped under the rubble of addiction and sin. Maybe you haven't lost your kids, but you lost your mom to cancer. Or your dad died too early. Or you've lost a parent or a grandparent or a sibling to an awful sickness. Cancer has hit my home a couple of times. Maybe you're in the middle of a pretty awful diagnosis yourself. And you feel like your physical health is underneath the rubble of a diagnosis. Maybe bandits haven't stolen your sheep. But inflation has robbed you of your financial security. And you're cashing in the 401k that was meant for your children's education. But now you're using it to pay rent. When you thought you would have been a house already by now. Raiders haven't stolen your camels. But mean people in the church have robbed you of your joy. Ooh. Of showing up on Sunday morning and serving. That's good. Maybe gossipers and backbiters and dividers, Pastor, have robbed you of the joy of standing in the pulpit and saying, thus saying the word of, of, of God, the joy of living for Jesus and serving is all but evaporated. Maybe natural disasters haven't destroyed your crops, but the chaos of life and the onslaught of worldly ideologies assaulting your hope has let you feel in shaken questioning and unsure and like Job the losses that you have suffered have left you feeling sad and that kind of deep sadness that just kind of hangs in the heart feels like a weight on your chest in the morning yeah. it just sits there when you're at work it kind of robs the taste of food the joy of living and the joy of life and Sure, you clapped on the two and the four, or most of you clapped on the two and the four in service here today. And you raised your hands at the right angle. And you've got all the clothes ironed and you look good. But when you're in your car driving home from work and the tears are rolling down your face, you're like, God, do you see me? God, do you care? Not a theology lesson, not that God doesn't know where Flora is, but a very real wondering, like, do you identify with where I am? Job says, I tell God this. I tell God that. What's the use though? I can't even stand before him. Let's cry crescendos in chapter 9, 32 and 33. Job says to his friends, He is not a man as I am. 
that I may answer him, that we should go to court together, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Only if only God were a man like me, I could stand before him. Only if only God were a man like me, if the imperceivable, un all powerful God were to somehow enter into the world of human fragility, he know. And I could make my case only if only there was a mediator with one hand on heaven, another hand on earth, one hand on God, another hand on me to bridge the gap. If there was somebody to cross the chasm between us and bring us together, God would see me. The dread of him would no longer terrify me in the raw of wrath. Job says would be taken away and I would not fear. And what Job did not know was that day out in front of the yard of the house as his friends were gathered with their judgmentalism that from Job's pain poured forth prophecy because as he cried out there was a mediator coming and thousands of years later the cry of Job was answered because Paul Attaching himself to the human race. I've come to you on, a, on this, this day to, to, to preach into a truth that you already know. The beauty of Jesus is that he is God to become a human being. God took all of his glory. God took all of his characteristics. God took all of his qualities, his personality. And that became a human person. In John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. When we get to verse 14, John says, in the Word, became flesh. He chose very, very specific. God, God took his plan. God took his glory. God took his purpose. God took everything that he was. And he tabernacled it in flesh. New Testament scholar M.T. Wright, when he talks about this, this opening in John's prologue, he says John is making a powerful statement as he stands around people who believe that the glory of God was found in a building. That the glory of Shall be upon his shoulder, 
and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Jesus is the Almighty God. Demons, we say it today. Demons tremble. just a human body. I understand it's part of our nomenclature. I understand it's part of how we describe the incarnation. We have these code words, but Jesus is more than God robed in flesh. He's more than God in a human shell. Jesus is God personified as a human person. So what makes you a human being is more than just a body. And Jesus is going to take your place and and pay your debt and substitute your sacrifice. He has to have a human mind. He has to have a human soul. And to have a will. His emotions had to be real. The pain had to be real. The whip biting his back. The, the cry that came from him could not be contrived. It had to be real. Jesus did not have a separate human identity from God. But humanity. Deity were united together in his spirit. That's why Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power. God expressed himself in flesh. He took all that he is, his will, his mind, his emotions, his heart. And incarnated it into a very real human person. Jesus was a human being in every way like us, yet without sin. But the beauty of the incarnation is not that God looked like a man in Christ Jesus. Not that God appeared to be a man in Jesus. But that God became a man. Just like you. Just like me. Yet without sin. You understand where this leads us then? Where we began? It's the answer to Job's cry. The incarnation is the answer to Job's prayer. If only God were a man like me, I could stand before him face to face and he would understand me and I could understand him. Well, Job, God became a man just like you. Jesus was human just like us. Yet without sin, he needed to pray. People go, why did God pray? Well, he prayed as an example. Yes, he also needed to pray. This pastor, he was dealing with people all day just like you. Jesus needed to pray. See, Jesus is the empathy of God on display. See, see, pity. Pity is when I, from my lofted and exalted position, look down on somebody who's smaller, weaker. I, I see, I see their frailty. I see their pain. I see their hurt. I look down and go, what a shame. Wow, that's sad. And empathy. Sympathy. There's something far deeper. And far more powerful. Pity says, I feel bad that you're lost and that you're broken. But sympathy, empathy says, I see you in your pain. 
I see you in your lost state. I see you in your brokenness. So I'm not going to stand at arm's length from you. I'm not going to stand from afar. But I'm going to leave where I am. And I'm going to walk a mile in your shoes. I'm going to put my arm around you. I'm going to lift you from the dirt. And say let's get through this together. I'm here with you. Let me put my arm around you. I'm not going to be repelled by your brokenness. Or your sin. Or your shame. I'm going to walk a mile in your shoes. Remember the cry of Job? I want you to listen to the cry of the Messiah on the cross as David writes, in the voice of Jesus, prophesy the Messiah's agony. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We don't, we don't talk about this a lot in church. We, we talk about the devil stomping and the chain breaking. We talk about Jesus from the authoritative, exalted position as the omnipotent, almighty God, and He is. But there was a moment in time where Him on the cross, He said, God, where are you? Why are you so far from helping me? Oh God, I cried in the daytime, but you did not hear. In the night season, and am not silent, but you are holy and thrown in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you and you delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm. This is Jesus on the cross. Have you ever prayed, God, why did you heal them but not me? God, why did you answer their prayer and have their kids pray through but it seems like my kids are getting worse? God, I was faithful to you and you haven't heard me. God, where are you in my suffering? All those who see me ridicule me, they shoot up the lip, they shake their head saying, He trusted in the Lord. Did they not say that to Jesus on the cross? If you're really the Messiah, come down from this cross and save yourself. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the point of death. Do you understand this? Is Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the answer of prayer of everyone who knows they need God but feels like he's too far away. Jesus is the answer of prayer to everyone who knows what it's like to be in a moment of extreme need but it feels like your prayers are bouncing off of the ceiling only to return to you unanswered. I'm here to preach against that The one whose glory is so profound that angels cover their face in his throne and cry, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Accepted the kiss of a betrayer. Grieved the loss of people. You had people leave you, betray you. You sat in your chair in the morning going, God, how could they have done that to me? You understand in the darkest moment of his human existence, Jesus was betrayed by one that was closest to him and felt the agony of that betrayal as it broke his heart, knowing full well he was about to die for the one that had betrayed him. People said bad things about your family. Maybe you grew up like my mom whose dad spent time in jail for killing somebody while drunk, living, going through Canadian winters with just coats for blankets, no blankets, no indoor plumbing, no running water, eating mustard sandwiches at school, suffering extreme poverty, looking at her and saying there's no good thing that can come from the Washington family. Well, she identifies with Jesus because people looked at him and said, God, who owns the cattle on a 
thousand hills, yet he sealed foxes and holes. Birds have nests. But I don't have anywhere to lay my head tonight. The one with no beginning and no ending took your stripes on his back, had a body racked with pain, and felt the sting and crush and creeping death. Jesus suffered so much that Isaiah would write, for he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Hear me this morning. You never have to wonder, does God see me? Does God know me? Does God understand me? You never have to question God. Do you know how I feel? Do you understand what I'm going through? Those of you that serve in ministry, you never have to know God. Do you understand the burden I'm carrying? Do you feel the pain of rejection? Like I felt the pain of rejection. Lord, do you understand how hurt I am? And my family that is no longer Joe. Destroyed by depression and heaviness. 
reliving over and over and over again wounds that should have closed up in your heart decades ago. But they're still festering and inflicted. Because you come to church and you feel like God wants your praise to not your pain. That God doesn't want that betrayal. That God doesn't want your disappointment. That somehow if you really pour out your questions in a time of prayer, you don't have enough faith. That you just need to decree and declare enough shout songs. That God isn't interested in the trauma that you're still reliving over the sexual abuse that you suffered as a child. Or the divorce of your parents, and that's why you feel like you can't trust your husband now. Or all of the problems like death and sickness, the loss of a job. That God doesn't want you to be authentic in his presence. And to pour out your real heart and your real life. That somehow God won't understand. But somehow God will be disappointed in you for not being a good oneness at the start. That God expects you to come into his presence and say every time, it's going to be all right, it's going to be good, and never once should you come and say, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sebastian. I've come to with the word of the Lord, combat that lie in your mind today. That God is not repelled by human weakness. That through the incarnation, God entered into the human race. And He has already gone before you. He has already suffered betrayal and disappointment. He has already suffered heartbreak. He has already gone through it all, including the sin of death. And He overcame when I sit on the throne of heaven. I'm on hope so that you have already had me to make your way to the altar. And so, God, here's my brokenness. You don't have to hide your struggle, your word. Say, come boldly, so that you may obtain mercy and grace. Stand with me all over this room. Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is God stepping into your mess and pulling you out. Grace is when you are overwhelmed, God steps in and says, I'll rescue you. Grace is when you're trying to let go of a betrayal that is years old. Bring them to the Lord and say, God, I am tired of dealing with this on my own. His compassion wraps his arms around and says, Give me a new. Grace is not the compassion of God. And the empathy of the Lord mixes with his omnipotent power and steps into the middle of your human frailty. And he makes you whole. I know everybody in this room is spiritual, otherwise you wouldn't have come here today for a Bible lesson. I know that everyone in this room has a spiritual life because you took time off work to get here. You could have been doing something else. But God doesn't just want you spiritually whole. He can make you emotionally and mentally whole. In this room today, He wants to give you grace. He wants to give you favor. You're already coming. I wonder if you just lift your voice right now. And begin to cast your mercy. Begin to cast your care. And cast your anxiety. Cast your burden. Don't hide. You can take the mask. I understand those people. You can't take the mask off of them. But you can take the mask off of Jesus. Maybe your marriage still apart and you're still hurting. Tell them about it. Maybe you have a child. you serve a God who walks with you. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, that's it, that's it. 
Maybe you're here and you're struggling with your faith and your convictions. Hold on to the Lord right now. You can be weak so that he can be made strong. You can be poor so that he can be made rich. In Jesus' name. I see lift our voices all over this room.